Hello and welcome to another edition of History for Role Players. How about if we finally address the Romans? At least an overview of their mindset. Now when I started gaming in high school, we were all Romans. It's not something I'm proud of, but it was very true. For Zetas, seven Romans comes to mind. Now who are these Romans? It's a tough question. Rome could be Mordor with the ring. Except they killed their own leaders often enough. If you're Roman, you're violent. That's probably the essence of the truth. Still, if you were to rank all civilizations in history, Rome would be number one in every metric. Size of cities, wealth and coinage, investment in standing army, dollars of trade adjusted for inflation, even fish harvested. Land subjugated and held, number of people who looked in and wished they were them. Rome was a nation of influencers. The rest of humanity was an afterthought albeit the various dynasties and nations of China would run a close second. Nations would fancy themselves as modern Romans. None of them were because they weren't of the same mindset. Roman values are simply odd. Loyalty inside the family, cruelty to all others. For nearly 2,000 years, Rome or direct Roman influence dominated events. The Vatican would never be without the Romans. Feudalism derived from Roman titles granted to later barbarians. The Italian Renaissance and the Fascists easily traced their roots to classical Romans. Mussolini's bodyguard even carried the Roman-style axes. All the roads of Europe ran along Roman-cut foundations. The width of all modern railroad tracks are based on the width of a Roman chariot, still cutting ruts in the pavement. All the capitals were built on former Roman settlements. Rome is forever a part of us, all of us. We are all Roman and it's truly a mixed blessing because we are also Roman in our dislike of things not us, things not Roman in whatever tribal name we use now. Rome, it's an interesting name. It actually comes from the Greek for bravery and courage. There is no record of what the first Romans called themselves. Their original language is not even known. It wasn't Latin. Latin is a tongue of the first people paying tribute to them as subjugates. It's always good to know the language of the people you're demanding subservience from. Like why billionaires in Bel Air learn a few phrases of Spanish. That's not a joke, and neither were the Romans. Maybe you might not want to listen further if you're not ready for the horribly dark truth. Still with me? Good. I gotta say I'm a fan. I wouldn't want to live in that era, but Rome is a lot of fun. Very soap opera, very crazy, in a Cinemax sort of way. It's very easy to understand how to be a Roman. They really have no nuance. They are fighters. Tanks. Given the best gear, and to hold an imaginary line. You have the elf. It is majesty and beauty. More of a Norse fey or Tolkien-inspired creation. Very wishy-washy. You have the ruggedness of the dwarf, usually played like a diminutive Scotsman, not the imps of Norse tradition. Then you have the party leader, who's usually human. He's Conan. He's a Roman. He's a quintessential murder hobo, yet one solidly with ambition. Now many would think that Conan is a barbarian, someone who would rail against Rome, but no. The saga of Conan was how he became the emperor of Aquilonia, and that is very Roman. Romans had goals and Romans achieved goals. They never as a society sat on their laurels and just crowed. The Romans were constantly innovating and expanding, assimilating and destroying. Romans worked. They never seemed to tire and never surrendered. Roman nobles worked as hard as their slaves, just not in the backbreaking toil. Now I could do easily six lectures on Rome, the politics, its intrigues and empire, but I think I'm just going to start with a general overview of the people. Romans are an adaptive people. Were they aliens? Hardly. Just very truly human in desire for pleasure and desire to lord over others. I'm in charge. Trust me. The ancient world did or regretted haggling that ultimatum. So once again, who are these Romans? Well, they're not the Celts. And they don't seem to be the Greeks. Did they spawn from some neighboring Latin tribe? Were they the worst outcasts, sent away by ostracism? Were they a criminal bandit gang in origin? They did adopt the language and cherry pick from distant cultures. 
They were not very religious either. That only would come later. Religion tends to be spread by women teaching children. The magnificent temples of Rome came with excess and an acquired taste for opulence during a period when emperors deified themselves and glorified the pantheon they gave themselves entrance into. What good is it to be a living god if those figment temples are just barns? Many Romans were actually atheists, believing in little supernatural. They believed in physical strength and had no idea where that came from. If there was a god Mars, he seemed not to like the Romans either, because they actually did lose a lot of battles. Romans would test the augury boring from the Greek uh, traditions, but they didn't care what the result was. They were man made up their line long before they consulted the gods. In contrast, the Crusaders in about 1100 AD refused to attack certain villages until the priests told them it was okay in God's eyes. The original Roman priests were seen as useless, sponges to use a modern term. They offered very little, they consumed resources, and any effort was really wasted on faith. Romans had no huge fund of food, no river indus. Very few of them could be noble or priest. They did have fishing, which suggested they had seafaring roots. They all enjoyed a sardine paste made with vinegar that they smothered on everything. That was the hot sauce of their people without those New World spices. Still, the reason the Romans grew powerful at arms was not by being citizen soldiers and having a levy of seasoned warriors. Most Romans never farmed. Many would not even know how. They stole. Someone else was going to starve so Romans could live. Foreign nations, first locally in southern Italy, then the whole of Europe and North Africa, the Near East, all would go hungry to feed Rome. Let those other places figure out how to waste bread on kings, priests, and judges. All had better work in the fields. All had better feed the excess mouths of Italy. There was the Roman as overlord. Bread in circuses, the term means exactly that. The pleb populace of Rome needed to eat and needed to be entertained. More and more these entertainments became bloody spectacle. In your fantasy RPG, if it doesn't have an arena, sanctioned or not by the local lord, where men killed each other for sport, you're missing out. It's an easy way to test ability before losing a character represents a significant amount of time. Many a fighter will be recruited by the staid party members those elves and dwarves, by viewing them in action. You would test a horse before riding, well, you would test your fighter tank by seeing him slaughter men inside of an arena. Someone will be on top. Who were the Romans? I keep asking that question. Well, the Sea Peoples come to mind. This was a strange migratory civilization, basically just destroyers, that appeared in about 900 BC and raided for another hundred or so years. They came with iron weapons and chariots, and even today the group is mere conjecture on who they were and from whence they came. Whence. It's a good fantasy roleplay term. I think the Romans were sea peoples. They had the same Scythian stock from the steppes of modern Russia that attacked Egypt for a couple hundred years, ending in 900 BC, and then the Romans were the refugees, the warrior migrants. Too many to feed back home, off they went to find others to pillage. They left no culture, religion, pottery, nothing to mark their reigns, these sea people. Really, if they weren't the Romans, who was? Here's what Pharaoh Ramsey wrote about these travelers. The unruly arrivals, whom no one had ever known how to combat, they came boldly sailing up the Nile in their warships out of the sea. Not Minoan, Achaean, Hittite, nor any eastern potentate of stamina none being able to withstand. It sounds very Roman to me. Romans were the Viking raiders 2,000 years before those Nordic guys. Now I'm told they did not wear the bull horns on their heads, but they should, it's pretty cool. Romans thought of themselves as outsiders, outcasts. They didn't want to come from anywhere, but they did have their myths. They saw weakness in the world and certainly that was not themselves. The two most popular origin stories were first, Romulus and Remus, which dated the first part of the Roman as 753 BC. And the other origin story was based on Virgil's Aenea, which placed their origin back to 1400 BC. Rome started like every other civ of the period, having a king. Their neighbor to the north, the Etruscans, taught them that. Now the Etruscans had a dynasty, kings, and a very complex religion. And as I said, they were just north geographically from the area of Rome. During this first period of Roman history, seven kings supposedly led the whole as a vassal state of the Etruscans. 
The archaeology suggests the two coexisted and taught each other. The Romans needed some time to multiply. Rome eventually slaughtered those foreign kings and established a senate of clan leaders. Romans hated the idea of divine right and a rex, a lord of birth. They liked the household leader concept with the true faith of might makes right. Now Romulus and Remus were twin brothers and the Romans fancied that they were actually abandoned by their mother or their mother was slain and they nursed from a she-wolf in order to survive. Imagine starting a civilization where you take pride in the fact that your founding fathers were suckling from a dog. Romulus would eventually kill Remus and establish the city of Rome. He is historically what they say was the first king. Now Virgil's Aeneas is a bit more complicated. Virgil supposes that after the end of the Trojan War, the survivors of that city actually stole the Greek boats and sailed across the Mediterranean till they eventually took home and settled inside of Rome. Virgil's story was very convenient because what it actually did was it allowed Romans to claim the area of Asia Minor, that's modern day Turkey, claim it as their own, as an ancestral right. And this was another theme about the Romans. They had laws protecting their own property but everything else in the world was fair game. Civilizations actually come and go. There's an interesting line in the uh, TV show The Sopranos where somebody says, where are these Romans today? Tony doesn't blink an eye, he just says, you're looking at one. The mobster will snarl and understand that Romans were violence incarnate. Now the Romans set up their civilization with the ideal of a clan. Each family was led by one person. Now you can call him an elder, you can call him a chieftain, both just really don't work. And the Romans themselves changed the title of who was the clan leader so many times that it really has lost its value. The words would be too obscure. The person in charge made all the decisions for the group. He also owned everything. And if you didn't like that, you were cast out destitute. You want to eat? Behave and obey. We all gladly follow a party leader, our Roman human, so long as he gets us easy kills and plenty of treasure. The Romans did not consider theft a sin. Not so strange from an RPG perspective. They did not steal from inside their family. That was considered wrong. There would be no intra-party pickpocketing. Yet anything not owned by the family was considered fair game, free for the taking. Any outsider complains? Kill him. The Romans also did not see murder as a crime, not until it became a true concern several hundred years later after the founding. Even then, it was more of a guideline. Someone offend you? Kill him. What are you waiting for? Kill him. Sound like any PC characters or bullies you know? The head of each family or clan, to abuse that term, maybe call it a tribe, was the person who owned the wealth of the household. He was male, he was big, he was blunt, he might have been charismatic. Wealth is very attractive. The head of the household could bestow gifts. He would be slain later by an even bigger brute to form a larger noble household. Family names became very important in Rome, yet wealth was centralized. Sure, each clan leader shared his wealth with his underlings, but you wore his clothes, his hand-me-downs, ate from his evening meals, had sex with his servants. Romans would award each other with ceremonial titles based on how large the picnics they held. These charity events were also used to recruit new members of the household. And that way, the families each represented political parties. You didn't belong to something outside or bigger than yourself. You belonged to a family, and that was Rome. The heads of failing households would even subordinate themselves to a greater clan, sometimes by marriage or sometimes by just outright giving their kinfolk away in slavery. In Rome, there were three classes, slaves, people with no rights, plebs, people with no property, and equites. Now equites, these were the men who owned horses. Pretty easy. Many people would know how to ride, but only a few of them actually owned the animals. When designing your fantasy campaign, paint this way in broad strokes. People should be an abstract until they are directly interact with the party. Otherwise, your campaign is just too complicated. Yet to ignore how the world above works tends to make the underworld travels rather meaningless. A mountain of gold for what? To remain landless and in squalor, waiting for a landlord to raise the rents to match your windfall? 
Rome, like every nation of the ancient world, existed with the labor of slaves. You need about 20 slave farmers to be a noble, to be idle, not that any Roman was. No one could survive alone. It took one person all year to cut just the firewood to cook, and any extra went to keep warm in the winter. He would not be able to hunt and farm while chopping with a stone axe, and Italy was a temperate climate. Slaves did this grunt work. Many American antebellum plantation owners read translations of Roman histories, admired themselves as the new Romans. Rome was not a democracy like the free male citizens of Greece. Rome had a ruling class that also led the military. Plus, plebs could appoint union reps of sorts as the name of tribune, and these could veto how money was spent. Yet the national treasury of riches, it's just not accurate. The richest men owned the wealth of the state, and those plebeian tribunes were more advisors of consciousness to steer how funds were used to help the general public. If you needed to build a new aqueduct, the money would come from a family in Rome. But if the wrong family was offering the money, the tribunes could come forward and convince another family to make the donation so that less people would be holden to that other family. Again, it was a political game on a masterful scale. The leaders of Rome thought of themselves as fatherly, even Caligula. They ruled and saw to the health of their beloved children. Maybe not the way a modern man holds his family dear, but the fathers of Rome would more think of family as an extension of power. Take, for instance, Spartacus, a real figure. He was a gladiator and did lead a slave revolt. He fought many battles and freed many slaves. He embarrassed his Roman masters. Spartacus, a Thracian, and his followers from every tribute state by the end, he had declared himself actually their king, eventually would be crushed by a Roman army. It took three of them, and the survivors returned to slavery. Actually, the survivors were put to death. Romans were mean. Every people would inflict harm on others. The Romans were simply the best at it. The word excruciating comes from their practice of nailing people to trees. It could take weeks for a condemned man to die. In the first minute or so, this torment, the victim would struggle to breathe and had to wail to draw breath. When Spartacus lost his final battle, lost his bid for freedom, the Romans crucified one slave every ten steps from Capua to Rome. Over 20,000 bodies were hung by crosses. The bodies there were left to rot. No one would take them down. The smell, the sounds, and pleas, it was very Roman to take joy in both. Now you might understand why me in my high school play, An Empire of the Petal Throne, was best unrecorded for posterity. Gladiators. Roman liked to injure and to watch people being injured. They bet on every kind of animal fight, human versus animal fight, and even bet on humans being executed. They enjoyed the spectacle of training men killing each other. This was not just in the capital, where the Colosseum was the finest. Every town and village had an arena, the size based only on the size of the audience. Men condemned to death, mostly slaves ruled too angry or disobedient to tame, were pitted against each other or simply beaten to death by a boxer using iron gloves. How many blows will it take? The over and under was 40. Good times, it was just a ball game to them. Take the kids. People who lived with constant violence made for eager recruitment into the soldiery. We get accustomed to thinking of our characters as heroic, our actions as valiant. But are they? Maybe we just like to play at being Roman in make-believe. The Roman orgy. It's historically true. People would dine together and end the evening with sex, switching partners. Romans could be the first civilization exclusively bisexual. Augustus would complain later that his bachelor knights needed to spend more time with their wives since the nobility was dwindling in members. Yet Romans were not really racist. Anyone given time and subservience would be able to claim Roman citizenship. It was races that refused to be Roman, adapt to their open lifestyle, that were considered freaks and could expect punishment. The early Christians especially come to mind. Romans did not value privacy. 
People even pooed collectively. No need to have individual stalls. They were a farting, belching, vomiting folk. The Romans actually invented something called a vomitorium, a place to discharge the stomach contents and return to gorge yourself more. Nudity was not forbidden. If it was hot, people would walk around naked. A large phallus was respected as a godly gift. Slaves with large cocks were traded like collector's cards. Gotta catch them all. Breasts were not seen as sexual. Women nursed children almost to adulthood. People scrubbed each other in and out of bathhouses. Images of sex adorned the painted walls of estates. The mosaic floors of public wells and water fountains had scenes of graphic pornography. The theater of the time was all bawdy and rude. These were farmers, and animals having sex meant money. People having sex was natural and a form of commerce. Rome had need for a large population, and they created it. Only with St. Augustine did prudence become a Catholic virtue. He railed against the promiscuity even as he himself was a serial rapist. His own shame led to a reinterpretation of Genesis. Before the creation story was seen as a quaint, a children's fable, but St. Augustine viewed it as the most important chapter of the Bible, eternal sin wrought upon man by Eve, a woman. Women were viewed after that as evil and unclean, and so begins the end of the Romans. But nearly a thousand years before that, there was the Republic. Everything was done in the open. They created elaborate bathhouses for pleasure of the hot water and for the sex. They allowed women to bathe for a slightly larger fee and as long as they offered sexual favors. People had sex in the Roman world. These were lusty people. They had a libido. The first city to reach one million souls, that was Rome. And it certainly was not justified by the fertility of the, of the farmland around it. Was that one million lots of foreigners? Well, some, but not really. The Romans were just a fertile people. They enjoyed sex often, and often they produced many children. Until very recently, kids just died. My own father was one of three of 11 kids to reach adulthood out of the slums of Newark during the Great Depression. Most women had 10 children and half were expected to die, some in the wounds, some at birth, many from childhood disease. Roman women had 20 children and most of them survived. That's lots of mouths to feed, but even more mouths to fight. The Romans were a fertile people. The only taboo they had about sex was brother-sister. This was a reflection of their early close contact with dynasties and religions that thought pure bloodline bullshit was important. The Romans saw the Etruscans as effete weirdos. Kissing cousins? No problem. Betting a sibling? Stop that. There were easier conquests in Roman society. Sex was just a part of life. These were farmers and animals rutting were a common sight. Man was an animal. Coitus could be used to build community and allow women some control of their future. The easiest way to gain a protector was to bet one. A woman would wake and have sex, go to the well and have sex, come home and have sex. Sex was on everyone's mind and was not shunned. Now should we look at this through a modern lens? I try not to view history with bias. I am not my ancestors, but let's not idealize what happened in the ancient cultures. Women woke and were raped. They would go to the well and be raped. They came home and they were raped. To the Romans, and probably to the women themselves, they did not see this as a crime. This was merely the caste order. When the Romans crossed with other cultures who regarded females as property and protected virginity as an asset to sell to richer and desperate men, the Roman proclivity to hump created conflicts that the Romans exploited. Go out and rape. It made the Romans terrifying. Rape was seen as dominance. Slaves were property of the clan leader, but everyone raped them. Women walking alone, raped. Women without male protectors, raped. Women with a male protector, well, ask first. The women live with this, and little is known what they felt. Contemporary writers did not write of women nor their thoughts. The only women half respected were Vestal Virgins, created in a much later era of the Roman state. And mind you, they too had sex, but only with the High Holy of the temples, or any randy emperor and his minions. Now a contemporary writer, Carcapino, he has a definitive work on what daily life in ancient Rome is. Unfortunately, his text is colored a little bit by his own homosexuality. He hates women, and he treats women, Roman women, with disdain. But don't be too quick to apply modern values to ancient people. 
be more horrified at the Roman utter contempt for human life outside of family ties. Yes, we all think rape is bad. The Romans didn't. They were a fertile people, and a swelling population helped their goals. One of the first invasions by Romans was on the Sabines. Romans wanted more women. The Sabines refused to share. Now the Greeks themselves, which the Sabines were, had their own odd philosophy on Mount Females. But the Romans came down, killed the men, took the dogs, and well, I said the mean word too much. It was a military tactic to the Romans. It also created more Romans. Women violated under their own culture were shunned by their own tribes. The Romans were happy to accept them as new family members. Welcome to the orgy. How woke are we today considering Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, the musical, mind you, had a song sobbing women about the Roman rape of the Sabines. 2021 is a radical departure from even the near past. You can thank feminism of the 70s for bringing humans up one more notch in our true humanity. But I digress. The Romans. Now Rome was invited into every country they conquered. The mistake of many was the hubris you could control a Roman. Other civilized peoples wanted Romans as lapdogs. The Romans would make every king their bitch. Sardinia was kind of first. There was a dispute between sheep farmers and goat farmers. The Romans were seen as a neutral party to judge the line in the hills where one flock should be allowed to graze or tother. Rome came in and killed the leaders, took both herds and settled. Another aspect of Roman values, stay. Marry local women. Change the place into your culture. Spread your values. Within a few generations, the people idolized Roman life. The greatest outsourcing ever to occur in culture up to the time of rock and roll. Many of the armies Rome founded were bachelor armies. They were fond of sending them someplace and leaving them there. Idle males could and did fight. Best to give them an enemy. The soldiers would come, look around, like the place and establish a garrison. They would marry locals murder the husband and brothers who might complain, built a village, and grew a city. Enlistment was for 40 years. You were mostly expected to die fighting. But by sheer multitude, some made it to retirement. Many foreigners joined legions because anyone who survived that 40, and not just you, but your entire family became true citizens of Rome, made men, only subject to Roman law and Roman court. Fug with anyone, and no one could fug with you. Again, that idea of a father, head of a household, making decisions, deciding on the sacrifice, and winning a goal for all. It's very Roman, and it worked for them as a civilization for a thousand years. Almost two thousand if you consider the Eastern Roman Empire under the Byzantines. Is there a lesson here for party play? What are the party of players wandering to? Is there even a point where far-flung roaming turns into settled life of politics and defense? Only a true Delver could stay in that trade forever. I'm not sure that's ever a motivation for any elf, Tolkien or Norris, or even Celtic Fay. Let's go on to the Pyrrhic victory, 279 BC. So some Greek chump, a descendant of Alexander, he wanted to conquer Italy. The Romans did what they did best. They fought and lost. What? Yes. Rome did not win very many battles. The best you can argue is that they never really lost any war, but battles were a shite show. Even later, when men like Julius Caesar fought, he had his ups and downs. The Roman Senate waged war on many a usurper and lost. Sulla, Marius, Crassus, Pompey, Caesar. These were all men who overstepped senatorial authority and in the end did what true Romans did, slaughtered and came back to parade as heroes. Now the Greek king Pyrrhus entered Italy with an army consisting of 20,000 infantry, 3,000 cavalry, 2,000 archers, 500 slingers, and 20 war elephants. Most of these were mercenary. They were just trained killers for hire. He invaded under the pretense that he was protecting the Greek cities of Lower Italy, but he intended to stay. His first battle was to subdue 10,000 Romans who liked owning all those Greek cities. The Romans in that battle lost 6,000 men, 60% of their forces. Now most armies rout after the first 5% loss. Those with great valor, maybe 10% of the hit points expended and then they're gone. The Romans fought to near collapse. The Roman warriors killed 3,500 of King Pyrrhus' troops. 
but he also included the sub-commanders of Pyrrhus, one of them his own son, who came forward to ask the Romans if they wished to surrender. Roman historians bragged that the Roman losses were actually even bloodier, that 15,000 Romans gladly died and another 13,000 Epirate allies died with them. Any culture willing to lose 30,000 fighting age citizens to slay one-tenth that number, you kind of ask if that group can even be governed. About a hundred years later, Rome would conquer Corinth, Athens, Sparta, Thrace, Macedonia, and it would hold that landmass until 1453 AD. What, only 1700 years? We got the term Pyrrhic victory from the aftermath. King Pyrrhus could not afford to lose a tenth of his army to mindless charging rabble. Alexander the Great lost just 500 men to kill 90,000 Persians and capture a real kingdom with riches. Armies were supposed to make townsfolk cower. His victory was catastrophic. These losses he couldn't take to win. He could not hold any claim to fame and fortune. His mercenary army wanted more money. A prolonged war would have been too expensive, and Romans would just make more Romans. There was no end to Romans. These cats were fertile. The Greeks would run away and leave Lower Italy for the Romans to fully subjugate. More women for them. More towns that in a short time were inside Roman clans and pledged loyalty to their favorite boss. The Republic with its Senate of clan heads lasted for a good long time. The first test of their nation was against the Carthaginians, down south across the Mar Interim, the inconvenient sea between. These were called the Punic Wars. Now the term Punic means treachery, an evil war, though some modern historians think Punic could mean Phoenician War, since seafaring Carthage claimed kinship to that city-state nation in the Levant, that's Palestine. I doubt Romans knew of Phoenicia at the time, and they called the war Punic Wars. I think Punic, its close relationship to punish, is more valid. The treachery war, or faithless war, may be closer to the truth. The Romans never felt they conquered a people, a legitimate civilization, that had any value. Everyone they subjugated was seen as an outsider, not a Roman. The world was Roman and not Roman. Not Roman meant no lawful right to live. People that were not Roman had no souls. There was no utter reason for being if you weren't Roman. Join us or die. Is killing an orc a crime? Typical of D&D party, everything you meet is considered a monster. This is a very Roman idea. In 264 BC, the Punic Wars eh, roughly began. There were three of them. There was the battle for Sicily, the war against Hannibal, yay elephants, and the final destruction of Carthage Prime. Let's talk a little bit about the first one, the naval wars. So in stage one, Rome built ships and died. Now, Carthaginian was a huge naval power, the best seamen of the Mediterranean. They were a seafaring nation. They traded and traded with everyone. I think they even traded with the Romans, but the Romans really didn't have much to trade with because they were not a nation that saw property as anything but something I own and something you have that I'm going to take. Rome built a fleet and started to uh, rampage around the shores of Sicily. Carthaginians moved their fleet up and sunk it. War over, right? Nope. Romans built another fleet. They even looked at the type of ships the Carthaginians had and said, you know, the Carthaginians know how to build a nice ship. Can we capture one so we can study it? Down comes another Roman fleet. Boom, it sunk. This time it took a few Carthaginian ships with it. This was an ultimate naval war of attrition. The Romans would show up with ships loaded with people. All they needed to do was dock. They weren't so much interested in the old ramming speed as they were just get close enough so we can jump on board. Imagine the crews of the Carthaginians seeing these rafts they saw as uncivilized, uncouth people and they slaughtered. Eventually, Rome built enough ships that the Carthaginians were not willing to fight to claim their possessions in Sicily. Now, Sicily at that time was divided by the, among the Greeks and the Carthaginians, so they just said, well, let the Greeks handle them, and the Romans would eventually handle the Greeks as well. It was one thing the Romans did was that they innovated. They learned from mistakes. Even in a trial and error approach, the Romans were fertile and had people to lose. Let's go on to stage two. A little while later, a general, you could call him a king, Hannibal, and his brothers, decided that the Carthaginian cause needed to be avenged. They also didn't like the fact that Carthage had lost Sicily. Sicily was a very valuable place. 
The Carthaginians had possessions in Africa, possessions in Spain, possessions in Lower France. They also had island colonies throughout the Mediterranean. And Hannibal wanted to get Sicily back. Now he could try a direct attack on the Romans, but he realized that would probably be tougher. Maybe, he thought, if I can go around through the Alps and down into Italy, the land route, that I can convince the tribes of Italy that the Romans were a bunch of dunderheads and barbarians, and why would they want to be Roman citizens? He totally misunderstood the enemy, but he was a very skilled general. Now, Hannibal attacked a long way round. He lost all of his famous elephants going through the Alps, but he overestimated the hatred that people had for the Romans. People hated the Romans, but they still wanted to be Roman. It's like you hate the organized crime, but if it's choice of being the victim of the organized crime or being part of that family, huh, is there any choice at all? It was his mistake. He was a warrior in mindset, and he just misunderstood the Romans' value. He thought to himself, why would anyone serve a Roman? Now, being Roman fed violent impulses, it was unquenchable, and anything foreign was worthy of death. By the time Carthage invaded Italy, the people from north and south were almost Roman in the same nature. Many Roman citizens were actually plebs, and they were willing to advocate all of their freedoms to a strong man who would say he would keep them safe and share his uh, lifestyle and wealth. Rome had one innovative general, Flaminius. Now Flaminius realized that I can't take an army out and just face uh, Hannibal, but I can nickel and dime him. He knew the lessons of the first naval war of the Punic War and realized if I can just send enough harassing forces against Hannibal, I can pick apart his army, degenerate his morale, and fight the long war. But the Senate wanted action. The Senate assembled 40 Roman legions, 20 of them professional groups that did nothing but train as legions, and 20 Levi's troops that they assembled at the time. That was probably about 80,000 men it sent against Hannibal. Now Hannibal knew this was his perfect opportunity. He camped his army almost right next to the Romans. When the Romans got up in the morning, they saw this invading army right next to them and immediately started to attack piecemeal. By the end of the day, Hannibal had surrounded that army and killed 55,000 Romans, including 80 senators, those would be heads of households, and 21 tribune representatives of the plebs. Another 10,000 captives would become Hannibal's slaves. It was the worst loss of human life in a single day, and as a military tactic, it was studied all the way up to the modern world. German generals and American generals studied the Battle of Cannae to find out how Hannibal killed so many so quickly. But Hannibal was unable to wage a siege on Rome itself. Because of Roman engineering, they built great cities, they built great walls. He just expected that after this huge loss of Roman life, that all of the city-states, all the Latin tribes, would immediately support him. They would see the Romans as, well, defeated. The Romans, well, they threw a nice dinner party, but, you know, they were your enemies. It wouldn't last. They went back to Flaminius. Flaminius started his attrition war against Hannibal. The Latin tribes did not rebel. They stayed allied to Rome. And then when Hannibal got word that his brother had lost Spain to another Roman army, where did Rome get another army? Well, the Romans were fertile. When Hannibal's brother lost Spain, the general had to retreat, and eventually he was defeated outside of his own capital at Zama. Rome had several standing armies by the end of this campaign, and Hannibal taught the Romans how to extend power abroad. Hannibal fled and lived out the rest of his life as a pawn in some eastern kingdom, training a foreign army that would eventually themselves be no match for Rome. Now the Romans learned from Hannibal great mimicry that they had as a people. They learned how to make a javelin that acted as the first armor-piercing ranged attack weapon, plus three spear. The same spear they modified so that it could be used to defeat the shield of a heavier army. It was called the pilum and the pilum itself could impale itself inside of a shield, and it was counterbalanced with a weight. And you cannot hold a shield up if you have this long pole sticking out of it with a huge weight on the end. Eventually the enemy arm would retire and they'd have to throw away their shield. 
Once they dropped it, you had another innovation that the Roman recognized, the gladius. Roman blacksmiths started pumping out cheap, mass-produced blades. So once the Romans could eliminate the enemy's shield, they could get in close combat and kill with these small bladed weapons. It's actually pretty fundamental now in retrospect, but it was an innovation that allowed the Roman legion to dominate all through the empire. The Romans didn't really suffer from a bias when it comes to superiority. They were influenced by it. If something worked for another nation, they would easily adapt to it. Most of the engineering marvels associated with Rome, the roads, the aqueducts, the large public spaces, this was Greek math applied by a diligent and hardy people. For the next 1,000 years, until the advent of a heavy armored cavalry, Roman legions were death squads. And those heavy armored horsemen were actually developed by the Romans as well in the Eastern Empire. Rome was just an innovative culture. Stage three of the Punic Wars. Now Rome did not forget about Carthage. It seemed to monopolize the thoughts of many of its uh, uh, heads of household. There was a debate going on on whether or not the soldiers that had won the Second Punic War should be rewarded, be given lands and allowed to start households of their own. But there was the continuing problem of what to do about Carthage. Senators would end their discourse on water well placement with Carthage still exists. Carthago delita est. Carthage must be destroyed. Sounds a little bit like Carthage must be deleted. Carthago delita. Yep, Cato the censor wanted them deleted. Plebs and the Equites were never allowed to think this war was over. War was launched again. It didn't even need a reason, just because Rome was ready to slaughter. The Roman idea, if it was good once, it would be good a thousand times ad nauseum. Well, in the Third War's case, let's double that. 2,000 catapults were created and brought to bear on the city walls of Carthage. Rome would capture Carthage by surrender. The leaders felt the victor would be reasonable and offer a deal. We have dyes. We have trade partners. We'll join you as a vassal. We'll do whatever you say. We have art to offer. Rome kills them all, burns and dismantles the walls, poisons the wells, takes salt water and pours it on the fields. No one would ever live there again. It was a second Roman virtue, no forgiveness. If we can't have it, no one will. The genocide was total, and in this case, the women as well were not seen as human. They too were slain, not even converted into brides. By the end of the Third Punic War, Rome had other potential victims and was more eager to conquer them and convert them to Roman. Scipio Africanus is a person who is recognized in history as a hero and a clan leader, and he stayed in politics for the rest of his life until he was quite venerable. He was mostly trotted out to support causes that favored militarization, and he was a, an advocate for allowing non-Romans to become Romans. Much of Lower Italy, those former Greeks who had over 300 years become Roman themselves, they became part of the true Roman Republic and that expansion of the Senate with a lot more people, a lot more heads of households, that would bring a lot of conflicts that resolve through intrigues and politics and we'll cover that at a later date. But within time, Rome would subjugate or Romanize so many lands that even generals who were defeated like Anthony and Cleopatra would be defeated by a general Agrippa and he was a true Roman, but he was born in Sicily a Tony Soprano of the ancient world. Well, I'm certain I have turned a few stomachs or not. I have lots more to say on the Roman Empire, the rise of Augustus, the politics of the Senate and the Republic, the creation of generals and legions, all of which are perfect for inclusion in a fantasy building campaign. As long as you're not solely interested in slaying the dragon for riches or taking the ring to a volcano. More later.